Hello, cruel world. I am your host for A Psych for Sore Minds. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and I live and work here in sunny London. I assess mentally disordered offenders in prisons so you don't have to. So this is part one of a three-part series about gangs. And I've included three real-life cases of patients that I've assessed. And variety is the spice of life, so I've chosen three very different cases. One was a gang-related murder of a teenager on another teenager, which is what I'll tell you about this episode. One was the target of a local gang, and the pressure and the fear that this man felt made him mentally unwell. Another case, I'm pretty sure a gang exploited a vulnerable young man, and they got him to do their dirty work. And he ended up in prison on a serious weapons-related charge. But first, let's make ourselves brainier by learning stuff till our head hurts. The first question is this, how do gangs commit crimes? Well, there are many reasons why crimes are easier for gang members. Firstly, they already have like a criminal network set up, so they might have like connections for drug deals, and they also might have uh, help already with money laundering. And also, they often protect each other, so they can give each other alibis, they can do witness intimidation. It's far more intimidating if there's hundreds of you rather than if there's one or two of you. Gang-related or organized crime is a massive problem. So for example, in some places in the States, it's believed that 25% of all crime is committed by only 5% of gang members. The next interesting question is why do people join a gang? Well, it's often thought of as like a substitute for family. So when there's no guidance, no boundaries, then people are susceptible to join gangs. And I think this is highlighted, especially by the three cases that I'll tell you about. And gangs often prey on the vulnerable. So they seek out young men and increasingly young women who might seem sort of misguided, have no direction, no support. It's also a form of protection. So if you live in certain areas like um, South London, London or the hoods of Los Angeles where there's lots of different gangs and different territories then some people feel like they might have to affiliate themselves with a gang just not to become a target. Also it gives some people status so if you make your way up the hierarchy you get money, you get cars, you get women and you can get status which means that you're feared and respected in your local community. So now I'm going to get on to talk to you about a gang related case that I've personally seen but first of all very quick break. So welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds. I'm your host, Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders or what the tabloids might call the criminally insane. I work in prisons and in courts and in secure psychiatric units. And I also act as an expert witness to advise judges in criminal courts across the UK. So this channel that you're watching dissects a whole range of mental health topics, some related to offending and violence, but some not. And there are new episodes out every Tuesday and Friday so look out for them and remember there's something for everybody in this podcast. So I'd like to tell you about the case of Mr. B. So Mr. B was 18 years old when I assessed him in a Young Offenders Institute. This was about two years ago, and I was doing this in my role as an expert witness for the criminal court, and I was asked to assess his fitness to plead. As always, I've anonymized the case and I've changed some of the demographic details. That's out of respect for patient confidentiality and also for respect for the victims and their families. However, I really would like to point out that the essence of the cases that I'm telling you about are 100% real. That's my USP. I think over other YouTube channels, I can talk about stuff that I've actually seen. So Mr. B was referred to me by his barrister because he was hearing voices and there was a strong history of mental illness within his family as well as criminality. Mr. B had three brothers. One of them was diagnosed with schizophrenia and another was diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And two of his three brothers were already in prison. And it appears that Mr. B's parents didn't work and they were, should we say, very lax in their parenting style. I think that's the most polite way to put it. So to give you an example, he lived in the same household as, as his parents, but he told me that he'd not even had like a proper conversation with either of his parents for two months before he was arrested and he hadn't even seen his father for a whole month. So I wonder whether this would have made him more kind of vulnerable, susceptible to joining a gang. Also, as I said, his brothers were involved in crime and I wonder whether or not they were also involved in gang culture. Mr. B didn't actually say whether this was the case, but it's something I suspected. So the index offence was actually quite high profile it was a gang related murder so Mr B and seven co-defendants thought to be in the same gang had a fight at a party and they were alleged to have chased a particular young man down some streets 
down an alley and they stabbed him repeatedly. At the time of my assessment, Mr. B was facing a charge of attempted murder, though what I've heard is that a few weeks down the line, tragically, the victim died in hospital, so the charge was actually changed to murder. So very serious stuff. By the time I saw Mr. B, he'd already been remanded for several months. And this was a complicated and slow case as there were so many co-defendants, a lot of the police were trying to disentangle. There was a, a lot of people involved, a lot of CCTV footage. And another issue was that very few people actually came forward, despite the fact that there was lots of people at this party and the police suspected that there was a lot of uh, witness intimidation going on, which is not unusual for gangs. So Mr. B, when I saw him, had no known previous psychiatric history. Never seen a psychiatrist, never taken antidepressants, etc. When he told me about the index offence, he basically said that he was chilling out with some of his friends at a party. Unsurprisingly, he never admitted to being part of a gang. And he said that at this party, some of his friends suddenly got into a fight, but course he didn't see what happened and then he said that he just saw some of his mates just running and he started to chase after them and he told me he was afraid for their safety so he followed them and he said he didn't know that they were chasing somebody at the time so mr b told me that he ran around a couple of streets and that a few of his friends came out of an alley and they were covered in blood and according to mr b he didn't even know that there'd been a fight he didn't know that anybody had been stabbed in fact he even said to me that he didn't discuss the incident immediately afterwards with his friends he didn't ask why they were covered in blood so you're probably thinking what i'm thinking which is this seems highly unfeasible but it's really important in my role as an expert witness for me not to comment on whether I believe the defendant or whether I think he's guilty or not. If I was to comment on this in my evidence, then my evidence could potentially be thrown out of court. This is something I've discussed a few times on previous episodes. So by the time I had seen Mr. B, he'd been hearing voices whilst he was on remand at this Young Offenders Institute for about six weeks. And he'd seen the prison psychiatrist and he was given an antipsychotic medication named Olanzapine he was prescribed 2.5 milligrams, which is pretty much the lowest dose. When Mr. B was describing the voices to me, the quality of his descriptions seemed real. They seemed feasible. I didn't think he was fabricating. And also he was stating that he was getting much better, which you wouldn't say if you were lying. So I thought he was probably telling me the truth about his symptoms. I've done a previous series on malingering and faking mental illness, including a few specific cases that I've seen. So check that out if you wanna learn more about that area. So according to the prison records, Mr. B seemed very paranoid in prison. He had lots of fights. And I wonder if that was gang related activity or if it was maybe psychiatric psychosis developing, or even both. Because in the words infamous Chopper Reed, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean people aren't trying to kill me. I couldn't really get that much information from Mr. B about those fights, because although he vaguely admitted to the fights, he refused to discuss them to me in any detail. Because as we all know, snitches get stitches. So I couldn't know his thought process when it came to the fights, and he didn't really tell me that much. He was quite guarded and evasive, so he didn't tell me that much about what was going on in his head. However, his functioning was actually relatively high in prison. So generally speaking, young offenders institutes have far more resources. And Mr. B was going to the gym every day. He was involved in some educational activities. So he was actually functioning quite well. So my conclusions in my court report and on the witness stand were as follows. I said that Mr. B probably was psychotic and this could have been related to the stress of the situation, you know, being only 18 years old and facing a very long jail sentence for attempted murder later on changed to actual murder and I also thought that his hearing voices could be related to drugs Mr B had a history of smoking cannabis and he tested positive for this whilst he was in prison so it could be a temporary psychosis for the reasons that I've just said or it could be like a longer term psychosis basically I'm talking about schizophrenia he has a family history of mental illness so that would make him genetically predisposed to this disorder so usually when I do a court report I give a definitive definitive answer in my evidence because that's what the court wants. But in this particular case, because the symptoms have been so short-lived and because Mr. B was so young, it was too early to tell the trajectory of his illness. So it's important as an expert witness to tell the court what you don't know as well as telling the court what you do. You need to know your limitations. However,
However, I advised in my report that he was reviewed regularly by the prison mental health in reach team in case it did develop into full blown schizophrenia down the line. And I sent them a copy of my report so they could use it for their assessment. Also, I pointed out that the dose of olanzapine that he was on was very low. So the maximum dose of olanzapine is usually 20 milligrams a day. He was on 2.5 milligrams. And in some cases, it can be prescribed even higher than that. So I said, if the voices or the paranoia were to return, there's a lot of scope to increase that dose higher. But as a good psychiatrist will only do this if it's absolutely necessary. So if there's breakthrough symptoms, because we don't want our patients to be on a high dose, we want them to be on the lowest effective dose. This is because they have less side effects and less long-term health issues. So antipsychotics are a very dirty drug and they're not good for people in the long term, although sometimes they are necessary. I'll do a whole different a Psych for Sore Minds episode on that one day when I have time. So Mr. B's barrister was really trying to push for me to say that Mr. B was not fit to plead and that he needed to be transferred to a psychiatric unit. But to be fair, his barrister did last speak to Mr. B a few weeks before my assessment. During that time, Mr. B was actually a lot more unwell. That's before his medications had fully kicked in. And also maybe the barrister has just felt a bit sorry for Mr. B because he was in a bad situation. He was facing prison for a long time at the age of 18, though obviously if he was guilty, then, then that's just a consequence of his action. However, I concluded that Mr. B was fit to plead. Not only could Mr. B answer the specific questions that you need to ask for a formal assessment of fitness to plead, known as the Pritchard criteria, I'll do another episode on a psych for sore minds about them in the future. But also there was kind of less direct, more subtle ways that I assessed Mr. B. So the fact that he sat down with me and went through a whole assessment for about an hour and a half and he was able to follow my conversation, able to answer my questions. And also I looked at his general functioning in the Young Offenders Institute, which as I've said before, was actually quite high. So all of this suggested to me that he might have been unwell, but at that moment he was stable, his medications were containing his mental illness. However, I did say that he needed to be followed up and observed. He didn't need any extra psychiatric support at that time, so he didn't need to be sent to hospital. Okay, I'd like to tell you guys before I finish about what is coming soon on a site for Sore Minds. There's a lot for you to look forward to. So I'll tell you about what's coming up in the next couple of episodes, but first, I'm really excited to share some news with you, with you guys. I am going to be a speaker at CrimeCon UK, which is going to be in London in June 2021. If you don't know, it's a massive convention. It's really popular in the States and it's coming to the UK for the first time ever. There'll be lots of expert speakers from law enforcement. There'll be reporters talking about massively high profile murders and other cases. And there'll also be talks from your favorite podcasters, YouTubers, and bloggers. I'm also going to be doing a talk at CrimeCon. I'm going to be talking about two real heartbreaking cases that I've personally assessed of two people who have killed their own family members and they both had mental illnesses. And I gave evidence in both of their court cases as an expert witness. One I found was criminally responsible for the murder because of their lack of a disturbed mental state, but the other wasn't. So if you are a true crime enthusiast, you cannot miss out on CrimeCon 21. See the link below to get your tickets and you can use a code, which is PSYCH, for 10% off. So until then, look out for part two of my series about gangs and offending. I'll tell you about a very unusual case, a real life case, somebody that I assessed of a young man who actually was a target of a local gang. And I believe the stress made him really mentally unwell and I'll, I'll talk you through his diagnosis. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it automatically recharges your phone. So comment more, please. I'd love some more comments on the YouTube videos. Start chatting to me and I'll be happy to answer back. Some people have reached out recently, which I'm very grateful for. I'd love to chat to you guys. Also, please follow us on Instagram, like our Facebook page, see us on Twitter and submit any questions that you have or any episode ideas to our email address, which is psychforsoreminds at gmail.com. And if you're gonna reference us, use the hashtag psychsore. Lastly, tell your favorite people about Psych for Sore Minds. They deserve it, spread the love. Until next time, stay euthymic and please remember, I love you.